Hey, good morning, everybody. Hey, welcome to Hope Church. My name is Tim, if we haven't met yet. And um, it's so good to meet you. So glad that you're here. It's Sunday morning, 9 a.m. service. You guys are like, like every time that I, I, I teach the 9 o'clock service, I'm just so impressed that like you're here. Like you've made it, and it's a little bit cloud, you know, it's cloudy outside and all this stuff. Like you could definitely be in that bed, but you're here. So congratulations, you made a good choice. Uh, this is going to be a good morning together. Um, so a word of advice for you. Can I, um, can I give you some advice today? Are you open to that? So if you're ever moving one of these high top tables here at Hope Church, like I just did, remember that the tops are not secured to the bottom. So I was moving one in one of our outdoor services, and I think Pastor Danny, our lead pastor, was teaching, and um, I didn't know it, and I grabbed it by the top, and the whole thing came apart and fell down during his message. Yeah, it was awesome. I was like raising my hand like, yeah, that was me. That was me. So I'm just saving you a little bit of embarrassment and grief, all right? That's how much I love you. So, all right, well, hey, this morning we get to wrap up a sermon series called Scarred, What to Do When Life Hurts. And I know that uh, the moment that we say scar and we say hurt, and those of you who have been around the church, you might relate to this, the moment that we say the story of Job, you know, you're like, oh, in fact, three Sundays ago, I started this series, I got to start the series, and, um, and as soon as I said the word Job, there was a guy like right here in the second row. He turned around and walked out. <laughs> yeah. Now, he was, he was joking. So about halfway down the aisle, he turned around and came back and sat down. But, um, you know, we don't like to grapple with tough things. Am, am I right? Like, I don't know about you, but like when I'm sitting down, like if I sit down on the couch and I'm going to watch TV, and I, and I realize that the remote is over there by the TV, I'm just like, oh, come on, for the love of all that's good and right. Oh, I get up and I walk over, right? It's like such a hassle to get up and walk across to the room, you know, and get the thing. Like, we don't like, we, you know, we love our comfort. We love our comfort. And here in America, we have a lot of comfort. And so this is a very timely, timely um, study for us to be walking through the story, the life of Job, and especially coming out of the last year or two. Um, in the last year or two, we've experienced some things as people, and we're still feeling the, 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 the reverb on that, right? We're still feeling the impact, and for a lot of us, all of the junk that we had going on in our lives leading into COVID like was amplified a hundred times in the middle of, of the pandemic, right? And all of a sudden, all these things that we've been experiencing has sort of risen to the surface. And so our leadership team here at Hope Church really felt that God was uh, leading us to walk through the story of Job so that we can all understand what to do when life hurts. And if you remember that, if you were with us, that first Sunday, I talked about this big idea truth, that with God, there's always more to the story. And we opened up the first section of Job, which was just the first two chapters. I read the first chapter and we walked that through and then we referenced the second chapter. And it was the story, basically the beginning of Job where his world fell apart. Uh, if you're just joining us and you don't know the story, uh, Job was a, an upright guy. He had it together. He was... He was good in the way that we would describe good. His life was good in the way that most people would think of good. Um, he had everything. His life was going well. And in a moment, it all fell apart. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. He lost everything. It was devastating. And we talked about that with God. There's always more to the story. And then Pastor Danny took the next week. And I covered the first two chapters, and Pastor Danny covered, like, over 30 chapters. Um, and it was the messy middle, right? It was Job wrestling it out with his friends, figuring out, okay, it, in a moment when it all went down, he turned toward God, which was the key, but then he had to wrestle it out. He had to go through his process. He had friends that were a little helpful, but mostly not helpful, 
And he had to wrestle that out. And Pastor Danny talked with us about this. It's okay to not be okay. Right? You remember that? So powerful. But it's not okay to go through it alone. And it was a, just a, a powerful Sunday. And then if you were here last Sunday, Chris, Chris, who led worship up here this morning, um, Chris led us through uh, the section of, of Job right at the end where God speaks to Job. So for, uh, for over 30, almost 40 chapters, God is, God is silent to Job. But he comes and he speaks to Job and he gives him perspective. He realigns Job's perspective with the God of the universe. And I, if you were there, I don't know how, t- how impacted you were, but I was deeply impacted. I needed to be reminded that the God of the universe is also the God that knows my struggles. And he's in the middle of them with me, and he sees the big picture. And if I can get a glimpse of him, it gives me the perspective I need to look at what's happening around me. And he led us, do you remember this? He he led us in this very powerful moment at the end of his message, where he led us in this sort of this three-step response, where instead of pushing away from our challenges, we lean in, we embrace, at least for a moment, and then we let go. God is there, God's got the big picture, and we can be confident that the God of the universe is in control. This is what Job has taught us so far. So we've seen Job's world fall apart, we've seen him wrestle it out, and we've seen God speak to Job. So today, I started with the first chapter three weeks ago, today we're gonna walk through the last chapter of Job. Job chapter 42. If you have a Bible, you can look in there. The words will be on the screen um, as well. And so you can just look at those if you need them. Today, we're going to walk through the last chapter of Job. And in Job chapter 42, God is going to reveal a truth to us. He's going to reveal a truth to us. In fact, you're going to see it up here on the screen. God has a purpose for your scars. So in this chapter 42, This is where Job now has has a turn. So God has spoken, and now Job gets to reply to God. And in doing so, Job provides for us a bit of a roadmap of how we live a life believing this big idea of truth, that God has a purpose for your scars. In fact, I don't normally do this. I'm not normally like one of these guys, but I'm going to do it right now. Are you ready to participate a little bit? So, so, so let's say it together. God has a purpose for your scars. You ready? God has a purpose for your scars. Now, that's not a COVID-friendly thing to do. I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, we're all talking in here together. But God has a purpose. I want you to get this point today, that God has a purpose for your scars. Like, it, you know, it, it's, it's great that we could watch Job go through the process of devastation and, and, and see him process it and then hear God speak to him. But ultimately, when we walk out of this place, it's, between, it, it's, up, it's up to you and I now to respond to what God is doing. This is important. And so we're going to dive down into Job chapter 42, starting in verse 1. You ready? Here we go. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this, God speaking of Job now, that obscures my plans without knowledge? Do, do you ever have like one of your kids speak to you? I, so, I, I, so I have three teenagers do you ever have one of your kids speak to you in, in a way that, that you might get the impression that they believe that they know everything? <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. So, so it's not just my kids. Okay, all right. So my kids do that sometimes. And, um, you know, God is saying to Job here, who is this? Who are you to think that you can speak to me Like, you know all things, right? This is Job repeating this back to God. He says, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, 
things too wonderful for me to know. He's come to a place of awareness in his life, his relationship with God, where he has acknowledged the fact that, God, I don't know it all, and I don't see it all like you do. It's a great place to be in. He said, you said, God, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you are going to answer me. Do, do, you ever, do you ever have that conversation with your kids? All right, we're, we're, we're about communication. We love communication. We want you to feel heard. But what I need you to do right now is listen to me, right? And then this, this amazing, amazing verse. Chris talked about it last Sunday, and it's worthy of exploring for two Sundays, by the way. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, that's a, that's a big deal, that word, therefore. Therefore, I despise myself. And Chris did a great job of defining this for us last Sunday. This is not a self-hatred term. I despise myself. It's an unfortunate English translation. And what it really means is um, I take a back seat. I, I put myself in fr- uh, behind someone else. I, I take back what I said, is what Job is saying. So, so myself that said those things, that wasn't a good self. And so I'm, I'm relinquishing my rights, my, my uh, hold on that self, and I'm now in a new self here. He's talking to God. And I repent in dust and ashes. Have you ever wanted to take back something that you've said or done before? Yeah? Yeah, I know. I know I have. So uh, my son, uh, middle son, Micah, graduated Athos High School um, on Thursday, last Thursday. And, um, and so we're super excited, and, and it was a great, and they had an in-person graduation, and, um, and it was the first time, it was at the fairgrounds, and it was the first time I had been to the fairgrounds when it wasn't the fair. So I had this, like, mental image in my head. And I was like, oh, great. Well, we get a, a graduation. That's cool. But at the fairgrounds, it was so beautiful. It was like this green manicured lawn. We all fit the blue skies, the mountains in the background. Everything was in bloom all around. It was amazing. We had this great experience. But my, my parents, who will be here at the 11 o'clock service, they, my mom had made for Micah this album of his life, photo album. And it's about 4,700 feet wide. I mean, it's like this a massive, she, like, she, like she comes down, and she's like, hey, I got you something for your graduation. And she's like, <laughs> you know, she lays the thing down, and we're like, what? We, can, we flip the first page, and we can't even see it. You know, we're like trying to, you know, get up on something and look at the thing. Like, it's this huge thing. I can't imagine how many hours she put into that. It's amazing. But we're flipping through the thing, and we're laughing, because Micah grew up in the, um, right as Justin Bieber was, was kind of, <laughs> right? Yeah, so he had the full, like, there was like, there was like, it, like if, you, if it wasn't a kid, you'd be like, this is totally like a comb over right here. Like, there's no part, there's just a flow, right? And it like, just like flows around your head. And it's like, and he had it. It was like full on, and we were like, oh, we're laughing at him, and they're laughing because in his baby pictures, I have actually have hair on my head, you know? And so we're laughing at all that. We wish, we look at pictures, we wish we, wish we could take back that stuff, right? Like, oh, no. Um, Job says, I despise myself. I remove myself from who I used to be, and God, I repent. And here's the first thing that Job shows us, right? And that God has a purpose for our scars, Here's the first thing that Job, that Job shows us. Job shows us that God will use our scars to change us as people, to change you as a person. Like, it starts with you. See, so we're not, we're not, Job is never told why God has allowed the things in his life that he's allowed. Job never finds out why. We get the benefit of looking at the story, and what we get to see is that God is changing him as a person. As an individual, God has some stuff. He allows some stuff in Job's life, and the end result of that process is that Job comes out a better 
man, a better follower of Jesus, a follower of God, right? He comes out, he has a greater awareness of the God of the universe. Have you ever been through a devastating time before? And you, you seek after God like with a passion you don't normally seek God with. And you experience a new side of God that you've never experienced before. Why? Because you're hungry. You're desperate for God. Right? Five, six months ago, when I laid in the hospital after heart surgery, I had a heart attack, and they did emergency heart surgery on me, and I laid in bed, and I didn't have my phone, and there was nothing, like, like I literally, there was nothing I could do. I, there was a TV there, but that didn't interest me, and so I laid there, and I just laid in the bed, and straight ahead, I'm sure it was intentional, there was a cross on the wall at Dominican, and I laid there, and I just looked at that thing for like 800 hours, and I was just, and you know what, though? I was so hungry, I talked to God the whole time. Do you know how long it's been since I prayed with like fervor and passion for an extended period of time? But I lay there in that bed, and I was just like, God, you know, and I talked to God about it, and I walked it out with God, and there was a passion and excitement. This is what God did in Job and what he does in us. Now, um, there's a deep-sounding theological term that is said like this. It's called sanctification. It's, it's, it's a fancy word, and you only hear it in the church. Sanctification, it's the process of becoming more like Jesus. And this is what God was doing with Job. He was allowing some things in his life so that he could become more like Jesus, even though Job didn't know Jesus. Like, he knew God. He was a lover of God, but he didn't know of Jesus and the Messiah. But he was a lover of God, and he became more like him in the process. In the New Testament, we see it described like this. James, the brother of Jesus, you'll see this up on the screen, says this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. By the way, that word joy, in the original language, one of the facets of that word joy is favor. Consider it God's favor when you go through trials of many kind. In fact, it says, consider it pure favor. Like the highest form of God's favor in your life is when you go through these trials. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. If you'll let perseverance finish its work, you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. How many of you would love to not lack anything? Right? In life in general, and especially in a relationship with God, like, I want it all. And God's like, really? You want it all? Like, Jesus often, he had people who would walk up to him and be like, "Um, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus one time was like, really? You want to follow me? You know that I'm homeless, right? Are, Are you ready to be homeless with me? Nope, okay, I didn't think so, right? God wants to do something in us, and it's only through the testing of our faith that certain types of fruit is produced. And if you want that faith, you have to go through it. All right, listen, I've already taken too much time. Let's keep going. Verse uh, 7, here we go, Job 42, verse 7. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Timonite, I am angry with you and your two friends. These are Job's friends, if you're just here with us for the first time. Because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So take seven bulls, seven rams, go to my servant Job, sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. Job will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer, and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. 
God repeats it in case they didn't catch it the first time he said it. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, that's the hardest part of my day right there, <laughs> did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. You guys, how do I not have time for this? I don't. I don't have have time for this. After he prayed for his friends who did him wrong, God restored him. Hmm. I I guess I'm going to go here. I guess I'm going to go down this road because this is bringing up emotions in me. After he prayed for his friends, God restored him. Some of you right now are wondering, where the heck is God? What is happening? And you're harboring a hurt in in your heart, and you refuse to release that hurt to God. I get it. I, I get what they did to you. N- n- not exactly your situation, but I've had people do it to me. They, they weren't supposed to do that as, as your friends. They were your parents. They weren't supposed to do that to you. Right? They were your friends, your classmates, your coworkers. You have people in your life, some of you, who have, who, have, who have inflicted great hurt on you, and you're wondering, where is God? After Job prayed for his friends to be forgiven by God, Job, God restored him. For some of you, that's all you need to hear today. Your only response to everything we're talking about here today is to go to God and say, God, I don't know what it looks like. I don't even know how to do this. But these people who have hurt me, I ask that you would forgive them, that you would bless them, that you would take them on their journey back to you. And you need to release yourself of the hold that they still have on your heart. Okay, we, we need to go. Here we go. So, thank you, God. Yes, thank you, God, for that. Uh, Thank you for that moment. I had not planned on that moment. Um, The Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Now, listen, this isn't a formula, right? God is not your magic genie in a bottle. In this case, part of God's redemptive plan for Job was that... um, the things he had lost were restored in the same way and actually more. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. Now, now let me just stop there. Uh, Do do y'all have family that even after you reconcile or even after you sort of come together, they don't quite get it? Right, they still don't quite get it. That's okay. They're in the process. But, but, but these friends and family didn't quite get it. They, God was not the one who caused Job's pain and suffering. But they, they, they don't quite get it. That's okay. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. Listen, here's the, way, here's the second way that God will use your scars, that God will bring purpose to your scars. Not only will God change you as a person, but God will impact your community. Look at what happened here. The people around Job were being impacted. His community was being impacted. They saw God meet him in his place of hurt. They saw God restore his fortune. They saw God involved and active. They acknowledged God, even if they were just a little bit off maybe a lot off, they still blamed God for his troubles, but they were in the process, like they, they, they were confronted with God and his presence and who he was, and that's the second way that God will bring purpose to your scars. There are people around you who are watching you. 
who are waiting to see you crack, are waiting to see you turn around from God and walk away. They're waiting. They're doing these things, and God will use your scars to impact the community around you. Can I, can I say this today? I need your scars. I need them in my life. Because God's going to do things in my life through your scars that, that he won't do. I don't have your scar, but you do. And as you share your God journey with me, all of a sudden I'm getting access to who God is through your scar in a way that I never would otherwise. I need your scars, and you need mine. You need me to share my God journey with you in the way of my scars. This is how God impacts a community, how he brings purpose through our scars. All right, let's keep going. We, we, we got we to gotta roll through to the end here, y'all. I, I wish I had more time. Here we go. Uh, verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of, God's, of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima. I'm looking at my clock, debating. I, I got I to gotta say this. We, we're going to read that Jemima has brothers and sisters and that they have children. So, literally, in the book of Job, we find Aunt Jemima. Here we go. The second was Keziah, and the third, Karen. Look, there's Karen right there. Karen. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and the father granted them, their father granted them an inheritance along with the brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died an old man full of years. Here's the third way that God will bring purpose to your scars. He will use it to echo hope throughout the generations. We see it right here just in the closing chapter of Job. In his sons and his daughters and his grandchildren to the fourth generation that Job saw with his eyes. Throughout the generations, hope reverberates through humanity because of the story of Job. Job is the oldest written part of the Bible. It's the first book of the Bible that was actually written down. Throughout all the generations until today, Job had no idea that part of his why he was going through it, part of God bringing purpose, was that some dude, was that some woman would be sitting in a Hope Church service in 2021 in Santa Cruz, California, wrestling with the things of God, embracing the things of God, um, seeing where God is and how God is impacting my life and, and, and my community the story of, of, of hope through Job has now made it through the generations to you. What will God do with your story? For generations to come, your story will reverberate through to other people. You know, it's um, five years, June is five years that my family and I moved to Santa Cruz. We moved from Atlanta, Georgia, and that's why when you hear a y'all slip out, that's, that's where that comes from. If I ever say you guys, that's my Chicago upbringing. Um, we moved here five years ago, and I've never shared this, this story from, from up here with you. Um, and, and not intentionally, and not, it just, you know, never fit. It wasn't, it wasn't, part of what fit, but I think it fits today. Um, we moved here to pastor a church, and we were brought in to, to help a church transition, a, a, a historic church transition into a new season, to, to in a very specific 
direction. Now, as a side note, and this will make sense in just a second, uh, as a side note, the direction of the church, that vision is what you're experiencing right here at Hope. So just hold that over here for just a second. 18 months in, the leadership at the church decided that they didn't want that direction. They didn't want that thing that they thought they wanted. We were called to be a part of a movement here in Santa Cruz County and the Monterey Bay and beyond, and they didn't want that. And that's okay. They didn't want that. And we weren't called to not do that. We were here for that. And so we went through the most challenging season our family has ever experienced. Our Job season was that season. We had to pull our kids out of school in the middle of the second semester. And we moved up into the East Bay. God graciously opened a door for us to move there. And we moved and we began to heal as a family. And then God gave us the opportunity to come back. And out of all the places in the work that I was doing, I could live anywhere in the western half of the country. And we chose to come back here. And people were like, what? What are you doing? You know, that, like, there's so many places you could go. Why would you go back to a place that was so hurtful? And we told them that we believed that God had kingdom business for us, kingdom of God business that wasn't finished. That vision he gave us when we moved here, we still had. It still got us up in the morning. It still drove us. And so we came back. And God, in his love for us, sat us down with Danny and Jenny Bennett. And they gave us a place to heal and a place to grow and a place to serve and a place to, to dive. As it turns out, remember that vision I said put out here? to dive right into exactly what God had called us to do. And we're so stoked to be a part of this team and what God is doing here. It's so amazing what God is doing here. And we get to be a part of it. We can't believe it. You know how we all pinch ourselves that like, I mean, not when we pay our rent or our mortgage, but we all pinch ourselves that we live here in this county, uh, in this place. We, we do that and we do the same thing when it comes to Hope Church. We can't believe we get to be a part of this. Now watch this. Um, our oldest, Summer, she is, um, she's going to med school. She's in college. She's finishing up Cabrillo, and then she's going into med school. Um, our son, Micah, uh, was a youth intern here this year. He preached his very first sermon and saw some students say yes to Jesus. Um, and he's going to school for ministry. And our son, Jake, not to put any pressure on him now, but he's the one up here playing the keyboards. And he's, yes, and he's growing into an amazing young man. Um, you know, God restored us. He restored us. And I'm not, I'm not Job. I'm, I'm not pretending to be Job. But God took us through the valley walked us through the valley and brought us to a place of restoration and healing and wholeness. And, he's, and it's what he wants to do with you. It's how God brings purpose to your scars. He changes you as an individual, which will change the community around you, which will multiply echo throughout the generations. This is how God works. And he's still in the business of doing it. He's still in the business of doing it. He will heal your hurt. He will turn your scar into something beautiful. He will restore you. And he does that through the person and the work of Jesus. Did you know that you can find Jesus? And we're going to close with this. In fact, our band is going to start to come up right now. Did you know that we find Jesus right in the middle of Job? Right in the middle of Job, we find Jesus. Watch this. You're going to see these, uh, these, these uh, verses up on the screen. 
right in the middle of Job. Job is in the middle of his, of his, of his mess, right? He's literally on the ground. He's got dirt, ashes. He's, like, he's in the middle of the bottom of the pit. Job 9, verse 32, it says, Job says this, God is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. He's not debating with God. If only, if only, watch this. Job says this. If only there were someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more, then I would speak up without fear of him, but as it now stands with me, I cannot. If only there were someone who would mediate between me and God. Now we flip over to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2 says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. The man, like literally the man, Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Isn't that amazing? Job had no concept of the Messiah, Jesus, prophetically speaks of Jesus in the middle of his hurt. And now you and I, we get to fully embrace it. We get to see the whole picture, the whole story, and we get to come to Jesus today as our mediator. We have our mediator. We know who that is. And we get to reach out to him today. Why don't we pray together right now? God, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your word that so powerfully speaks to us. Oh my goodness. God, it's so amazing. God, thank you for reminding us today that you bring purpose to our scars, that you change us for the better, that you impact our community because of our scars, and that through the generations, your story of hope will be told because of our scars. Truly what the enemy designed for evil, you are turning into good. Thank you so much, God. Thank you for that. You are so good. You are so loving. You are so gracious. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, we never want to end a service here at Hope without giving you a chance to say yes to Jesus. Jesus has given you an opportunity right now to say yes to him. Today is the day that you get to receive him. It's simple. We admit that Jesus is who he says he is. That he died in our place. That he is our sacrifice. And that through his resurrection, we now can have victory over sin and over death. We believe that Jesus is who he says he is. We admit that we need him. And we simply humbly come to God as best as we know how. And we commit to turning ourselves toward Jesus. And it's as simple as this. And if you're in this place, in your, in your heart and mind silently, you pray this with me. God, thank you for giving me your presence today. Thank you for reminding me that, yes, I do have a need And I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, as best as I know how. And right now in this moment, I want to say yes to the love of Jesus. I want to receive that love of Jesus. I want you to bring purpose to my scars. And so I say yes right now in whatever way that looks like, God. Would you help me? Thank you so much in Jesus' name. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, closed. If you, if you prayed that prayer, would you raise your hand, look up at me? Thank you. I see, I see those hands. I see those hands. Online right now, would you click the button that says, say yes to Jesus? 
Nobody will see that you click that button, or who clicks that button, rather. And after you click that button, there'll be a button that says, request prayer. Would you request prayer with one of our host team members? They'd love to pray with you right now. For the rest of us, God, thank you so much that you are bringing purpose to those places in our lives that hurt the most. God, as best as we know how right now, we give them to you and we ask that you would do your work in us. God, that perseverance would produce in us the fruit of having everything that we need in this life. So God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you for those right here, right now, who just said yes to you. God, we celebrate that. We're so stoked. Those right here and online who have said yes to you. God, thank you for today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen.